Good morning, everybody. It's time to get started, so let's all stand. seated. Spring, summer, right? Spring will come back next week. But we got a couple of days. Uh, a couple of things that are not in your bulletin. Uh, we're looking for people that can help out with uh, communion the first uh, Sunday of the month. So if you're interested, see Pastor Evan. Also, just again, not in your bulletin is on May 5th is our business meeting. So we're just a few weeks out of that. Uh, we will have the Hayes here next Sunday. They're missionaries, possible future ones that we might help. Uh, they will be here during Sunday school downstairs. There will be coffee and donuts. So if you would like to come during class time at 930 next week to watch them, they will be here. Cool? Free donuts. Well, someone's paying for them. Uh, all right. Uh, keep in mind for a prayer. We always have a prayer list. And yes, there are a lot of things going on in the world right now. Yes. But God's always in control. All right, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for your, for your wonderful, your grace, your uh, awesomeness, Lord. With so many things happening in the world, we know these are just the beginning of birth pangs. You're in control. And this is where I ask, Lord, that you just use your spirit in us, because this is a time of revival. This is a time for us to go out and uh, disciple for you, Lord, instead of shelter in place. So I just pray for all of those here and all Christians uh, worldwide to uh, do your will, Lord, and uh, hope that we could bring people to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, let's all stand again. Got you. 
your praises out. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. Chains of sin had shackled me, but God in heaven heard my plea, and Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever. Jesus, Jesus, rescue me. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, rescue me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. song will sing for all of time. The grave is empty. I am free. Cause Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Yes, Jesus, Jesus rescued me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever Slow it down a little bit.
This is a reading from the book of Esther, uh, chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that, it was, that in the third year of his reign he had made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the prov provinces, being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords and fine linens, um, and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance, according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the dr drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown, in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, Marsena, and Memekan, the seven princes of Persia and Media who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti according to the law, because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuchs? And Memekin answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women, so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to, to be brought before him, but she did not come. This very day, the no noble ladies of Persia and Media will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive contempt and wrath if it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out for him, from him, and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it will not be altered, that Vashti shall come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree, which, will make his, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memekin. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master in his own house, and speak in the language of his own people. Good morning. Well, as you can, have you noticed, we were uh, starting our series on Esther this morning. Yay! Yep. <laughs> there, you should be cheering. I mean, Esther's a great book. Right, you're dismissed. That's funny. I was going to do it. <laughs> We are starting our, our series on Esther uh, this morning. 
Uh, before we jump into that, though, I have a couple of housekeeping things that I, I would like to go over. Uh, the first is kind of a, maybe a little bit boring. Um, you, uh, if you give online with us, we are switching the, uh, the processor that we use um, for online giving. So for a number of, uh, a period of time, it's been Tithely, um, and we are moving over to using uh, a processor start called Planning Center Giving. The primary reason why we are, we're doing this is because it's gonna be cheaper for the church. Um, and so that's, we're always looking to save money and extend resources and, and make changes where we need to. And this is one of those things after uh, consideration, we've decided to switch from Tithely over to Planning Center Giving. If you go online um, this morning, you will see if you go to BethelTopeka.org uh, slash give, there's a, uh, a new page with a new link uh, to give through Planning Center um, if you want to do that. If you already give uh, online through Tithely, don't worry. Um, we are going to continue processing those donations until everybody switches over to Planning Center. You will get an email this week ex uh, that fully explains how to migrate your online donations over from Tithely over to Planning Center Giving. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple process, uh, but I wanted us just to take a moment, address it, um, and let y'all know um, what's going on there and the reason why. It's primarily um, because it's gonna end up saving us money, the processing fees that uh, Planning Center charges us for each online donation is significantly less than what Tithely is charging us right now. And so we're just looking to save, save money, extend resources so we can um, have more of that to do the mission uh, that we have and that's to reach people uh, for Jesus. Amen? All right. Uh, next, I, I want to thank everyone who came out yesterday for the work day. We had uh, a good n number of people there um, helping with a lot of variety of projects. Um, Larry was uh, playing the entire day um, in his, uh, in his what he called it his toy, uh, but and he was up counting down trees and doing shingles on the church. It was uh, really amazing to see. Um, also, uh, just amazing to see other, uh, how many people came out and just uh, wanted to love on the church by working on some projects. If you did not have the opportunity to, I also want to thank the deacons for setting that up and, and having uh, all the work ready for us to do. Um, if you did not have an opportunity to come out and you wanted to help and you're like, man, I, I'm, I was working or um, had a birthday party or something, guess what? There's more projects to be done. We weren't able to get through all of them. Um, and so if you have time and you want to, uh, Joe's going to be compiling a book um, that we're going to have available to you, or you can go talk to Joe. Um, and he knows what all the projects need to be done. Um, by all means, come up during the week or on the weekend and um, help us knock out those things, because each one of them uh, is a priority for us, and we, we want to make sure they all get done. All right, thank you all to everyone who came out yesterday. All right, let's jump into Esther. Um, thank you, Wendy, for reading Esther 1 uh, for us this morning. Um, if you, uh, has anybody seen the movie 300? Um, I know it's, it's not, maybe, maybe not the greatest movie out in, in the world, but um, I remember it came out in 2006, and I was in high school, and, and then I also went into the military, and, and it was, it was like the man's man movie. If you wanted to go see a movie, especially in the military, I think, I don't know how many times uh, I saw it because of, you know, they're like, oh, Spartans, we got to be like Spartans. And uh, you had the whole Gerald Butler uh, workout, the Spartan workouts that people followed and everything. Uh, my point is um, that today we're going to be talking about Esther um, and you heard in uh, scripture, if you, if you, in the ESV or maybe the uh, KJV or um, other uh, versions, you heard the term, or the, the king that we're talking about is King um, Azu Harris, okay? But that is simply a Hebrew transliteration of Xerxes, okay? So I want us to 
understand where we are in history. And the reason why I mentioned 300 is because the king of Persia that was invading uh, the Greeks at the time, right? Uh, check the money. Okay. Yep, it would be helpful if I turned it off. But everybody could hear me, right? Yep. There we go. <laughs> I'm just that. All right. Uh, thanks, Kevin. All right. So the king, uh, the king of Persia, who was invading the Greeks at the time, was Xerxes. And so this is the same king that we see and depicted in the movie 300, um, where he's battling against 300 Spartans and, and uh, ultimately defeats them at the Battle of Theopolis. Um, uh, and, and so... Uh, now, I don't know if that's an accurate depiction of what Xerxes look like or not. There's uh, pic- other pictures that make them look very different. Um, but I want us to understand the time period of history that we're in. So we're around the time. So Xerxes came to power around four, uh, 480, 484 um, BC. And so think about this. Socrates was born in 470 uh, BC. So, so this is around the time of, of Socrates um, and, and the Greek empire of Athens and, and Sparta and stuff. Um, and, and Xerxes was born to King Darius. And, and Darius, um, if you are, have ever studied in uh, uh, history, Darius launched a campaign um, against the Greeks and uh, the Spartans. And, and ultimately, he failed um, in this campaign, and it ultimately led to his death. Um, and so Darius was the king before um, Darius was the king before Xerxes, and, and Darius was also the father of Xerxes. And, and although Xerxes was not the firstborn um, of the family, uh, the firstborn of the family was, was born to a commoner woman, um, and Xerxes was born to the daughter of Cyrus, King Cyrus. And you probably heard of King Cyrus from Ezra, as you read through Ezra. If you've read through Ezra, King Cyrus is mentioned in Ezra. Um, and so there's a lot of history here. And so it was determined because the, essentially Xerxes had greater royal blood because he was the daughter of King Xerxes and the, the, uh, or the son of, of, from the daughter of King Xer, uh, Cyrus and the son of Xerxes. He had a greater th- claim to the throne of Persia. And so that's how he came to power. Um, after Darius was killed in his campaign against the Greeks, he comes to power. And um, you have also probably heard of, of Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes, who is mentioned in Nehemiah. And so uh, Artaxerxes, he, he gives permission to Nehemiah to go and start rebuilding Jerusalem and the nation of Israel, right? He, he goes and sends them, and Nehemiah builds the wall, and, and Artaxerxes is actually supporting that, right? And so this is kind of where we are in, in history. I want, I want to bring it to, to reality to you. It's not just a story. It's history. And so Xerxes, uh, the events of, of, of Esther and, Xerxes, and this, this period of time of Xerxes' rule, last, uh, this book covers about 10 to 15 years. It's a small book. It's only, about, it's only 10 chapters. And the 10th chapter is really short, too. But it covers about 10 to 15 years of history that we're going to be going through. And the book was written several decades after the events as well. And tradition states that the book was written by Mordecai. Now, I, we don't know that that's, that's true or not, but the author clearly had intimate knowledge of what was going on. And so that's why it's traditionally held that the book was written by Mordecai probably um, a decade or two after the events happened. Another interesting thing to note about this book is that Esther 
It's the only book in the Bible that never mentions God. All right, so we're not going to see God directly referenced in the book of Esther, but that does not mean that God is not present. In fact, God is very present, present, and he is working behind the scenes, and we're going to be talking about God's providence and, God's, uh, and how God oftentimes is working behind the scenes, and we do not see that direct influence until after. Okay, so, so even though Esther does not mention God directly, his presence And his providence is clearly there. And so as we're going through the book, I want you to remember that God is present and and he has providence over all things. As I was was thinking about this series, uh, I was actually reading through Esther in October. And remember what happened in October? Israel was attacked uh, in October, and as as I was hearing the news about Israel, I was reading, um, I was reading through Esther, and I was like, "Man, that is an amazing uh, kind of story and history about how God's providence has been there to protect God's people," and it got me thinking about it, and. Um, and, and so since October, I've been wanting to preach this series. I've been wanting to go through this series because it is, it is genuinely a really cool story of how God's providence is working behind the scenes to protect us and to move things to Christ's return. And so if, uh, and in fact, yesterday, right before we started this, you might have heard Iran launched over a hundred drones and missiles toward Israel. So we're right in the thick of it again. Um, The other thing too, is this year is an election year. And uh, this year, and in election years in the United States, as, as many of you know, are years of, of uh, well, I call them an annoying years because it's just constant cam- con- campaign ads and, and the annoying years of the U.S. Because, I mean, you're just fed this, these lines of just uh, vote for me and this person's terrible, this person's great, and then they flip-flop and they say, oh, well, now this person's great. I never thought he was terrible. Um, but we're also in election year, and so we can, we can get so caught up and have almost a savior complex or a messiah complex on our political fi- figures. And so I thought it was a really good time to look and actually see where our salvation is and where our trust and faith should be. And it should be in our political system or a political candidate that we're, we're having. Um, but rather it should be on God and understanding his providence and how no matter what happens this year, no matter who is elected, God is in control. And, and for many people, that is, uh, many people don't realize that. And, and election years can be very disquieting, a lot of discomfort for them. Because Genuinely, you've seen, you've seen I, all the pictures and videos, and I'm not trying to rub this in, but you remember the pictures and videos of when Trump won in 2016, of people who were literally crying, thinking the world was going to come to an end because a political candidate that they did not vote for won an election. We as believers know that no matter the outcome of the election this year, We are safe and secure in God. Safe and secure in the reign of King Jesus. And so that's another reason why I thought this was a good series to go through at this time. Because we are in in a a year of of upheaval, of political uh, unrest in in a sense, because, well... Our politicians and our leaders are attacking each other because they're vying for power. 
All right. So we've already read through Esther 1, but we're going to be going through Esther 1 this morning. So if you haven't already, you can open your Bibles and follow along because we're just going to be walking through Esther 1 this morning. And, and we're going to be looking at the different characters that are introduced here in the entirety of the story and how God's providence in our lives today, how we're meant for this moment, how God made you and placed you here in 2024 in Topeka, Kansas, or if, if you're online, you're watching online, wherever you are, that God placed you here right now at this time for a purpose, and you are meant for this moment of time. Just as Esther was meant for this, for her moment in time, you were meant for this moment in time. I want to start off by looking at uh, verses one through eight and how one through eight demonstrate to us the power and position of the world versus God's providence. Chapter one, verses one through eight. It starts off by demonstrating, or, or um, the, the story begins um, at the time that Esther was uh, uh, most likely written, Xerxes um, had suffered a military defeat at the hands of the Greeks and had probably been killed. But also, instead of starting on Esther or with the Jews, the author rather begins by giving us a picture of Xerxes and the wealth of his kingdom. So this is how the story begins. Instead of, of where you would think it would begin, it starts giving a picture of Xerxes and the wealth of his kingdom. And it's an extravagant wealth. Um, the wealth that is displayed here is almost unimaginable. Okay, I want to give you kind of an example of, of what this wealth is. So one century later, um, the uh, Persians were conquered by Alexander the Great. And one century after these events, the Persian Empire had lost a lot of its wealth. Okay, it had diminished in its wealth. Um, because of failed military campaigns and the expense of running the expansive kingdom that they had. So one century after these events, when, when Alexander the Great conquered Persia, it's recorded that Alexander the Great, they found one or 1,500 tons of gold. And that's just gold. I'm just going to talk about the gold. Now, 1,500 tons of of gold. That's a lot of gold, right? Uh, more gold than I've ever seen, more gold than you've probably ever seen, more gold than we'll ever be able to see in our lifetime. Um, in today's worth, one ton of gold is worth about $65 million. All right, so that means if they found approximately 1,500 tons of gold at that time, in today's worth, it would be worth $970 billion, $500 million, so almost a trillion dollars. And I'm going to remind you, this is after the Persian Empire was diminished. And so when they came and, ra uh, and, and raided the king's palaces and the king's treasury, they found a basically a trillion dollars. There is no one, on the, no one on earth right now that has that type of wealth that we know of. Except governments. In comparison, uh, it's estimated that the U.S., which has the largest stockpile of gold, um, has about 8,000 tons. Okay, so the... So we have about 8,000 tons. So the Persian Empire back in, in 400 or around 400 BC had about a fifth of the wealth of the United States that we have right now, all under the control of the king. And so the amount of extravagant wealth that is displayed in verses 1 through 8 comes into 
this picture. This is, this is wealth, and, and with that wealth, Xerxes is buying power. The picture here is that Xerxes is demonstrating his wealth in order to buy power. Now, now not much has changed in 2,500 years because people with wealth still buy power. Not much has changed in 2,500 years. Darius, his father had launched a campaign against the Greeks and failed, but Xerxes was bent on finishing this campaign, and this is where we find ourselves. Xerxes had invited the nobles of his kingdom to essentially have a six-month party financed by him so that they might support him when he raised taxes and conscripted their people for his war against the Greeks. He basically said, hey, come to Susa, where, where, I, where I'm living, his summer palace, because there's four capitals in the Persian Empire, and, and Xerxes loved Susa. It was a summer palace. He said, hey, come to Susa and hang out with me for 180 days, six months, and party with me. And, it, and then at the end of it, where we see the last week of this, this last seven days, he basically opens up. His palace and says, drink and eat whatever you want. Whatever you want, you can have. This is the amount of wealth that is being displayed here where he is flaunting his wealth and his power in order to gain support and the people are very influenced by wealth and power just as today we are influenced by wealth and power. So I, I talked about how we are in an election year and, and how when you hear about this, this six-month party where, mil, where, where wealth is being displayed and, and um, for, for buying power, the, this seems very fam, pretty familiar. And today we, we raise millions of dollars for campaigns. They have campaigns events where, where just to meet with a person and talk to a person. I, I, heard, um, I heard about a campaign event that, that Joe Biden was having with, with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, and they were charging something like $25,000 for five minutes with them or something like that. I mean, that's uh, and the, the insanity behind the wealth that is being flaunted for the buying of power. Campaign events cost millions of dollars. Millions of dollars are spent on ads, all to garner our support, your support for things that they want to do or their parties want to do. And then we, we turn around and we look at our political leaders oftentimes as saviors or villains. We look to, we look to our political leaders, we look to the, the people running, the Trump or the RFK or Joe Biden, we look for them and we say either they are our savior, if, if this person gets elected, our country's going to be on the right path, or if this person isn't or is elected, our country's going to be destroyed and it's going to go down the wrong path. Maybe, but God is in control. We look, we look oftentimes to our political le leaders and sa as saviors or villains. And I say this because it is very evident, especially in the evangelical world, about how, and I would say, we have forsaken the idea of God's providence, and we have looked to our political leaders to somehow straighten out the mess of the world. Instead of looking to God and what God's answer to the mess of this world is. The mess of this world, the answer to it is Jesus Christ. It's King Jesus. It's, it's the fact that he came and he died on the cross for our sins so that we might have salvation, that he rose again so that we might have redemption and a relationship with God. It is only through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit that we can overcome our sins and, and we become better people, people that God intended us to be. It is not, it is not meant 
There's a quote out there that you can't legislate morality. And I'm not talking about how we're, we're called to legislate morality or, or we shouldn't try to create laws that, that have moral backing, because we should. But the answer is not, our, not the political leaders, but rather Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that don't go and vote. We live in America in a very unique situation. Throughout history, there has been, uh, this, is, this is the only experiment where, where history, we can go and vote and influence our government in the way that we influence it. And so, by all means, I am telling you, as believers, you should be in the voting booth. Every single time it is open, not just on national elections, but on city elections, on school board elections, on state elections, you should be in the voting booth voting for the candidate you believe best represents the gospel message and biblical values. You should be in the voting booth every single time. You should be volunteering. You should be, you should be running. So, there might be somebody in this room that God has said, I want you to run for office. City council. Maybe a state representative. I don't know. But there might be somebody in this room that God is tapping you on the shoulder saying, I want you to do that. And you need to be doing that. We live in a very unique situation and we should be taking advantage of that. But I want us to realize that for all of Xerxes' wealth, for all of Xerxes' wealth that he is demonstrating to his noblemen and his people to vie for power, all of that came to an end. Just like eventually the power that the United States has will come to an end. Whether it, it's, it's through military defeat or Christ's return, it will come to an end. The United States is not forever. Our political parties are not forever. Political leaders are not forever, but God is forever. Amen. In a commentary I was reading um, for this on Esther, it says, to such a person, the Esther story stands as a warning that whatever ease and prosperity one might enjoy, whatever worldly power and position we have, uh, have been attained, ultimately there will be a reversal of fortune that will end in death and destruction. And we're going to see that theme throughout Esther. This reversal of fortune, no matter what power and position they have, a reversal of fortune that leads to death and destruction. As we move on through uh, Esther 9 through 12, I want us to look at um, how the book of Esther is the romance of providence. This is a quote by uh, John Vernon McGee, um, where the book of Esther is, is the romance of providence. God directs this material universe in which we live today by his providence. In fact, it's the way he directs all of his uh, creation. And so my second point today is that the seemingly insignificant becomes God's grace. The seemingly insignificant becomes God's grace. And that's because when, when we look at this, when we look at this picture where, where in verses 9 through 12, Queen Vashti is also giving a feast for the women of his kingdom. And so on, on the seventh day, the king, um, he's drunk on wine, and he's like, hey, I want to show off my beautiful wife to all the nobles and everything. And so he calls for her. 
calls her away from her, her royal duties of doing this, but she also had a royal duty of obeying the king, okay? And she refuses. And we might see that as a seemingly insignificant choice. Vashti's choice to not go to the king seems insignificant, but it kicks off a series of events that ultimately lead to the salvation and protection of God's chosen people. Now, there's a lot of debate behind, if you read the commentaries and and read about this, why Vashti did this. Now, I'm not here to talk about why Vashti chose uh, to, uh, to, to disobey the king, whether or not it was right for her to disobey the king, or whether or not she was up against women's oppression or anything. That, that's not the discussion here. The discussion is how insignificant choices, or what we consider insignificant choices, or choices that we make on our everyday life, greatly impact the people around us and can work into God's plan in great and mighty ways. Because Queen Vashti's response to the king and choice to disobey the edict to come and be flaunted in front of his nobles ultimately led to God's grace on his chosen people. He was fulfilling the covenant that he had made with Israel many generations ago to keep them, to protect them, because he knew what was coming down the line. And so in this choice, in Vashti's choice, God is setting up an opportunity for Esther to come and be put in the place so that when the time comes, she might act. And so I want us to think about all the maybe insignificant choices that we believe are insignificant that got us to this point, got you to this point in your life, and realize that those insignificant choices or choices that you're making are all part of God's plan, all part of God's providence to set you up for the works that he has laid out in front of you. God has prepared works for you to do, and all the choices that you are making are leading you to those works. The the commentary that I was reading through also says this, when we think of redemptive history, we think of the great miracles that display God's power. But these mighty acts of God are linked together through long years of human history by a chain of seemingly insignificant ordinary events. We are now living in one of those long stretches of history between the ascension and the return of Jesus Christ. Like Xerxes of long ago, modern kings and presidents and rulers make decisions from purely political motives. Like Vashti, people today unwittingly make decisions that they have long, that have long reaching consequences far beyond what they could have foreseen. These events may be completely secular and perhaps made by people who give Christ no thought. Nonetheless, through them, God is moving all of history forward to accomplish all that must happen before the return of his son, Jesus Christ, the true king of kings. The point here is Vashti had no idea that her choice to disobey the king would lead to her being ousted as queen and for Esther to come in as queen. She had no way to to see that in the future. She did not know that her choice was going to lead to that outcome. And we make choices today. People make choices maybe for you that, that maybe you see as, as a wrong choice or a choice that is hurtful, but you don't know what God has in store for us down the road. 
I'm going to give you an example from my own life. In my 20s, the one thing that I wanted to do was become an Air Force pilot. It's something that I had wanted to do since I was seven years old. I had worked my entire life for that. And I had gone to, uh, I got into the Air Force Academy, and I attended the Air Force Academy, and I was there for three and a half years. I did not graduate because in my senior year, in October of my senior year, I failed a physical fitness test. And that physical fitness test ultimately led to me being disenrolled from the academy. Basically, I was called into my commander's office and said, hey, you're leaving. And it was not my choice. Now, ultimately, was, I, was, I was devastated. I, I wanted to be a pilot. That's the only thing in my, like, that's what I had worked for my entire life. And God closed that door for me. It was not my choice. Somebody else made that choice for me. Now, I can look back 15 years later and I can say, that door closed. That person made that choice to disenroll me because God knew that if I stayed there, became a pilot, I would stay in the Air Force, serve 20 years, which is not a bad thing, but I would never become a pastor. And it wasn't until years later that I realized that God had been talking, he had, he had been talking to me, he had been urging me in my spirit, and I had been quenching that spirit like anything because I wanted to be a pilot. I had been quenching the Holy Spirit. But what, what I didn't realize was that God had a better plan for me. God had a better plan for me. He had a plan where he wanted me to be in ministry. He wanted me to be a pastor. He wanted me to go to seminary. He wanted me to be your pastor, to be a pastor at Stonegate, to be a pastor at Stillwater, to be a pastor at Bethel. He wanted me there for whatever reasons. And I don't know all of the reasons why I'm here at Bethel, other than the fact that I want to be faithful to his providence that he led us here. But it all went back to a decision that was out of my control. It, was, it went all, all back to a decision that was out of my control and, and I didn't like. The fact is that God is moving. God is moving using our choices and the choices that we make and the choices other people make around us to a goal that we might not be able to see. Vashi had no idea how her choice to disobey the, obey the king on that evening would lead to the protection of of the Jewish people. No idea. As we move on to verses 13 through 22, we see that Vashti's refusal to come to Xerxes, Xerxes was angered. It says he was enraged and his anger burned within him in verse 12. And as oftentimes as men as, and, 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 uh, and women, uh, when we're angry, we turn to our own wisdom. And so what does the king do? He turns to his wise men, the seven, seven men that are allowed uh, in front of him and, and ask them what to do. And I want us to look at how the wisdom of men here is foolishness. The wisdom of men here is foolishness. Edmund Burke in his Reflections on the Revolution of France says, government is a uh, contrivance of human wisdom to provide for human wants. Men have a right that these wants should be provided for by this wisdom. 
And so if, I hope you catch the irony in both the statement uh, by Edmund Burke and, and what is being given to us in, in this story um, in verses 13 through 22 here. First, that human wisdom can be manipulated to achieve whatever our human desires want. What we want, we can justify with human wisdom. And we can use human wisdom to get what we want. No matter how evil that might be. And the government is often the tool that is used to implement this. We see this here in verses 13 through 22, but we've also seen it throughout history when you look at Adolf Hitler and his persecution of the Jews. In Stalin... In, in Mao, in the execution of millions of Chinese. But it's not just outside. The U.S. also uses this as well. We see moral failures in, in our presidents of Nixon and, and Kennedy or in Clinton or in Trump or even our current president who has been connected to some really shady things. Men use human wisdom to get what they want. And human wisdom is often manipulated to justify what they want. And they use that power to, that power to, to get what they want. This is what Xerxes is doing right here in verses 13 through 22. He is using his power. He's going to his friends, his buddies, and said, my wife didn't do what I wanted to do. The queen didn't want to do what I wanted her to do. What should I do? And they're like, you know, do all these things. Banish her and, 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 and make it known throughout the kingdom that, that no, no woman can disrespect her husband. And he's like, oh, man, that sounds like a great idea. I'm going to use all of my power all of my influence to do this because I was wronged. And we see that so often, not just in our political leaders, and, but we see that in, in our cities and the corporations that we work for, and unfortunately, even in churches, where people use their power to hurt and influence others. Second, the irony and humor, I think humor on the author's part, God does have a sense of humor in case you didn't know that. But I hope you catch this humor in here on the author's part, that the one thing that they didn't want to happen was for the women of the kingdom to hear about Vashti's disobedience and possibly influence other women to disobey their husbands. Because, oh, what a crime that would be, right? They it would be complete meltdown of society. And in wanting to, in wanting to uh, squash this possible rebellion of women and, and, their, uh, and, and making sure they did not hear about Vashti and, 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 and uh, pushing her out, um, what did they do? They, they sent a message to the entire kingdom about what she had done. There's some irony there, some humor there, right? I don't want you to know about this event, so I'm going to tell you about it. So you don't know or you don't do it. And this also says a lot about marital power here. And I want to talk about that. Scott McKnight says that uh, I believe in a wife submitting to her husband, but I don't believe the husband ever has the right to demand it. In fact, I know that when I am worthy of submission, my wife submits, and when I am unworthy of it, she does not. My responsibility as a husband is to be worthy. How different is this attitude of a Christian man, of the Christian man toward his wife compared to that of the men of the Persian court? The men of the Persian court 
saw Xerxes with power and they said, let's take advantage of that so that we can take advantage of others. But Christ tells us, he gives us a different picture in Ephesians 5 of how we were trying, uh, because Queen Vashti was his wife. Christ gives us a picture in Ephesians 5. God gives us a picture in Ephesians 5, a picture of what the relationship between Christ and the church, King Jesus and his bride is to be. That, to be. And, it, and he gives it through the marital relationship. And it's clear that wives are called to submit to their husbands. But in verse 25, it lays down what environment that submission is supposed to be in. Husbands are called to love our wives as Christ loved the church, giving ourselves up for them. It goes on to say that husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. It's an odd thing, the idea of self-harm. We see this as, as mental illness, we have, we have uh, suicide hotlines, and, and if somebody goes into a hospital with self-harm or self-mutilation, they're oftentimes given a psychological evaluation as somebody who is in need of help because a normal person, a normal person on their day-to-day, -day, we nourish our bodies, we take care of our bodies, we, we cherish our bodies, And this is, this is not the picture. A husband, uh, uh, this is not the picture that we're, we're given here. The picture is that we're supposed, to, we're supposed to cherish our bodies, but we're supposed to cherish our wives as we cherish our bodies, right? A husband that is not loving their wife as Christ loved the church is harming himself, a, a, a husband that is not loving their, wa uh, their wife as Christ loved the church is doing self-harm. Far different from the statement that is made here in Esther 1 that says that every man be a master in his own household. In fact, if you've used that phrase or heard that phrase, I want you to realize that you're having the same mentality of a man who used his power to rape, kill, and torture. A man who should not be admired. If you're a Christian and you have this idea in your mind, then you have misunderstood the gospel message. You have misunderstood what it means for men and women to be bearers of the good news of Jesus Christ. If you're sitting there, and I've heard it before from men in church, not necessarily Bethel, I haven't been around y'all long enough to hear something like that, maybe, I don't know, um, that, I, that I should be the master in my own household. Man, you're quoting King Xerxes 2,500 years ago in trying to use his power to subjugate women. That is not what the gospel preaches. That is not what the good news of Jesus preaches. That is not what Ephesians 5 says. But rather, it's Matthew, uh, Ma Matthew 20, uh, 25 through 28, says, you know that, that the rules of, gen of the Gentiles lorded over them, and they're their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be among, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be a servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so you, you see, chapter one is all about Xerxes' power, his wealth, his power, his position to dominate and subjugate. It's demonstrating that Xerxes only carried about, or only cared about his power, and he used his power to influence, to subjugate, to dominate. 
But the gospel message gives us a different picture of what we're supposed to do. The gospel message tells us to become a servant. If you want to be great, become a servant. If you want to be first, become a slave. Just as Jesus did this for us in giving his life as a ransom for many. It's going back to Scott McKnight. Jesus is always worthy. Jesus is always worthy of our praise. Jesus is always worthy of our obedience. Jesus is always worthy of our submission. Scott gives this picture where, where if, if he's not worthy, his bride is not to submit to him. But if he is worthy, that's, that's the situation where the wife should be and is willing to submit. Well, Jesus is always willing. And so we should always be submitting to him. The bride, the church, always can and should be submitting to the Lord. While we are waiting, though, it is clear that we are to understand the personal power each one of us holds and wills and wields that power as Jesus, as Jesus wielded it. Whether as a husband or a, a wife in our own homes, or as a spiritual leader in a church, or as a CEO of a large, large corporation, or the head of state of a great nation, or working at a gas station, or working at a factory, or taking care of your kids at home. We are responsible to resist the temptation of misusing our power for the satisfaction of ungodly lusts in any of its forms. Uh, Ian uh, Ian, Ian Dugid has a, uh, has a quote here. It says, Esther 1 reminds us not to take the power and glory of this world too seriously. And the reason why we, we don't take the power and glory of this world too seriously is because the power and glory of this world will fade away. It will be destroyed. It will come to an end. And so why, why should we take it seriously? The only thing that is eternal is our King Jesus. The only thing that is eternal is God. And he should, we should take seriously. We should take note to what he says about power, what he says about wealth, about what he says about how to live and love and serve the power and positions that one amasses in the world are nothing in comparison to that of God. And the seemingly in insignificant things to us can, can be used by God. And it might be those small acts that God uses to show grace to this world. It might be the small acts that you see as in insignificant that in somebody's life changes them radically because they see God's grace in it. It might be a small conversation. It might be an encouraging word. It might be a refusal to do something wrong. It might be an encouragement to do something right. It might be just to be there in their presence when they're going through something hard. Those small, insignificant things, just as we see with Vashti, with Queen Vashti, when she made that choice to disobey her husband or the king, she didn't know the repercussions. She didn't know what would come out of it. But those small, insignificant things could be what God uses to introduce God's grace into somebody's life or into this world. And it's important to remember that the wisdom of men is foolishness. The wisdom of men is foolishness. And so we are to seek God's wisdom. 
We are to speak, seek God's truth. In a book that does not say the name of God, God's providence is clear, and we're going to see that as we walk through Esther. Esther chapter 1 reminds us that sometimes we have to wait to see what God is doing. We see this picture of power of Xerxes, and, and we're not sure what's going to happen. But Esther 1, it reminds us that sometimes we have to wait to see what God is doing. And sometimes patience is the hardest thing. Sometimes patience is the hardest thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the fact that you are working in our lives, in each one of our lives. You're working in this church. You are working in the city. You are working in our nation. You are working in the world to bring all things to completion, to bring all things to, uh, uh, to completion when Christ will return. Lord, we pray that as we leave here today, that, that we might walk in a way worthy of the works that you have for us, that we might be seeking to do those works, that we might understand that every single moment, the things that we are doing impact those around us, and that you can use those things, even the small things, in great ways. Lord, I pray that, that we, would, we would not chase after the power of this world. That we would not be influenced by the power of this world and, and get sucked into the lie that, that somehow whoever wins an election or, or whoever is our governor or whoever is our council members or whoever is in charge that, that somehow you, you don't know that or that you are not in control. Lord, let us, let us be reminded and seek and, and, and feel comforted by the fact that no matter who's in charge, you knew that what was going to happen, you know what's going to happen, and you're in control in your providence, Lord. Lord, I pray that though, too, that, that you, have, you have placed us here in a moment of time for works to be done. And when that time comes, when those works are in front of us, that we might act. As Esther, as we will find out that Esther does, when, when it's put in front of her, that she demonstrates the courage and bravery and acts when it's her time to, and that we might be on guard and always looking for those moments for the works that you have in front of us. Shall we stand? <clears throat> We're going to sing a couple songs as we close today. We're going to start off with, Oh, Praise the Name.
without Christ, we are nothing. <clears throat> We're going to close with, Lord, I need you. <laughs> Father in heaven, you are an awesome God. You have done so much through history, and your word teaches us so much of what you've done. There's so many predictions that are in the Bible that took place hundreds of years before the prediction came about. There's so many things that the Bible tells us, such as the world is a sphere, things like that that were there before, way before Columbus ever sailed the ocean blue. Your Bible, Lord, is so harmonious from front to back. It just all goes together. We look at the story of Esther, and we can see the amazing things of how your hands were involved in what took place. We know that as Christians, nothing for each one of us happens by accident. If you're born again, nothing happens to you by accident. Always look for God in what takes place in your life. Thank God is another way to think it as well. So, fathers, we're out and about. We just pray that you would put your hand of grace and mercy upon each one of us. Keep us safe. Lord, help us to be ready and able to speak and to glorify your name when we're given opportunity. 
And in so doing, Lord, bring us back together again, that we can have an awesome time just worshiping in your name, singing songs, listening to Pastor bring the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.